This is the opening lecture on Maxwell's equations. This will then complete the AP Physics C curriculum prior to the actual AP Physics exam itself. This is part one of that series of lectures. Over the last couple of months of this class, you've been introduced to Maxwell's equations and their basic applications. They are as follows. We first of all have Gauss's law. This expression here, where the left-hand side, if you recall, is a closed area integral. And then we also have Gauss's law for magnetism, also sometimes called the no-name equation, and it basically describes how there are no such things as magnetic monopoles in nature. Okay, and then we have both Ampere's law and Faraday's law, both of which are described as line integrals. So we first of all have Ampere's law, which is describing a line integral involving a magnetic field. This expression here. And then we have Faraday's law, which is another line integral, but in this case it's drawing an electric field, or describing rather, an electric field. this expression here, well recall that the magnetic flux on the right hand side of the expression is the following. This open area integral here involving magnetic flux. Okay, now there are obviously similarities between the four equations. However, why are they referred to as Maxwell's equations? So far, I haven't said a word at all about what it was that Maxwell did over the course of the last couple of months. Well, Maxwell realizes that there's something wrong with Ampere's law. Ampere's law is missing a term. Something's missing. The easiest way to see what's missing in this expression is to picture a situation involving a discharging capacitor. Okay, now for a discharging capacitor, I'm going to go ahead and draw it nice and large here for clarity. So let's say that this right here is the positive side. Let's say that this is the negative side. So then therefore, at any instant in time, we have an electric field that looks like this. Recall for a parallel plate capacitor that the magnitude of the electric field here is uniform. And at some instant in time, that magnitude is E. Okay, the plates themselves of the capacitor have an area A associated with them. We discharge the capacitor, and then therefore current I flows like so. Okay, now as the current I begins to flow, this then means that the magnitude of the electric field here in between the two plates decreases with respect to time. Decreases as time elapses. Okay, and then imagine what's happening down here below the parallel plate capacitor. Let's say that we calculate out the magnetic field down in this region here, and we do so by just setting up a basic problem involving Ampere's law. Now, we would have done so in the following way. We would have set up a path, for example, as a circle, like so, where right here that circle is centered on the current I. So then, therefore, you would have a current enclosed by your path, and then you would set up Ampere's law just as we did back in chapter 28. In this particular case, because the current I is pointing in this direction, this then means that the magnetic field would circulate like so on the diagram. Okay, so kind of drawing this three-dimensionally, the wire or whatever it is is passing in front of the black circle that I've drawn there in the background, and then therefore the magnetic field circulates like this. It looks like so here on my diagram. However, 
let's say that I draw the path, not as a circle as I've done, but as a weird looking saddle shape, as it's called, like this. Like so. So imagine that saddle shape, as I just drew, is something that kind of looks like this. And then we would set up an integral involving this saddle shape in order to calculate the magnetic field. We already know from Ampere's law that the magnetic field exists down here. However, if you make the calculation by using this saddle shape, notice that there is no current enclosed within that saddle shape. The current is only passing through this circle down below, but not this shape. So something is wrong. In other words, Ampere's law, as we've written it thus far, is incomplete because it's not taking into account a situation such as this. Moreover, once again, look at the similarities between Ampere's law and Faraday's law. In Faraday's law, an electric field is induced when you have a changing magnetic flux. Does it work the other way around? That is, if you have a changing electric flux, does that induce a magnetic field? It does. And the reason why it does is because Maxwell realizes that another current is actually present. How would you describe that current? We would do so in the following way. Notice that I'm now writing an extra term here in parentheses within Ampere's law. This extra term is still being multiplied by the permeability of free space constant. What is this extra term right here? Notice that I've written it as a current, but specifically what I'm describing here is the decreasing charge on the capacitor's plate as a function of time. This quantity right here, Maxwell refers to as the displacement current. Once again, this is describing the decreasing charge on the capacitor's plate as a function of time. Let's write this expression here in now in terms of a changing electric flux through that saddle shape that I drew up there on the top board that's passing by, or through rather, the electric field. Okay, so how do I go about doing that? Well, we already know that at any instant in time, the magnitude of the electric field between the two plates, if you recall, is the following expression. Okay, and then sigma, of course, is the charge per area. So let's go ahead and move this term here to the other side of the expression. And then write the sigma here as charge per area like so. Let's go ahead and take the area and move it up here to the left-hand side of the expression. Like so. And then notice right here, this right here is actually a flux. This expression right here in its most general form is the following. Notice that it's an open area integral that's describing an electric flux. In the simplest possible case, you would just simply have that area integral as E times A. So this guy right here, is that electric flux expression. Like so. And now what we do is we just differentiate it with respect to time. When we do, we have a changing electric flux that is passing through that saddle shape up on the top board. So when you differentiate this with respect to time, you have the following expression. This is the extra term, that is this extra term here that appears within Ampere's law. So then Ampere's law is actually written now in the following way. Ch 
changing electric flux induces a magnetic field. Once again, there is a wonderful symmetry here now between the two expressions, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Now in Ampere's law, a changing electric flux with respect to time induces a magnetic field. In Faraday's law, a changing magnetic flux with respect to time induces an electric field. What are the implications of the symmetry between those two expressions and the symmetry that you see present in Gauss's law, that is Gauss's law for electricity and also Gauss's law for magnetism? We'll explore that in part two of today's lectures.